Hi, I'm Andy Teach, host of Andy's Awesome Adventures, and welcome to Ireland. And we are here at the Rock of Cashel. And we will be taking a tour in a few minutes. Just started drizzling, typical Irish rain. Do we need another umbrella? I'm good. All right, let's roll. We'll roll when Andy's Awesome Adventures is done Fine. filming. Okay, now we can roll. Tour starting soon. It is great to see you all here today. My name is Sandra. I'm going to give you a guided tour of the site. We have five buildings here at the Rock of Cash that we're going to take a look at this afternoon. The buildings we have here all date from 1101 or later. But this site was initially established as a royal site in the year 370 by Conal Cork, who was the King of Munster at the time. And it remained a royal site or the seat of kings until one of the kings here gave it as a gift to the church in 1101. At that point it became a religious site until the last bishop in turn decided to leave the Rock of Cashel in 1749. So we have two distinctive periods in the history of the site, the early royal period and the later religious period. Now during that early royal period there were a couple of significant events that took place here. The first of those was the coming of St. Patrick to the Rock of Cash in the year 450. Now I'm fairly sure you've all heard of St. Patrick. If you grew up Christianity to this country, before the arrival of St. Patrick there were people here really who never heard of Christianity. Pockets of the country were Christianized by others before his arrival but it was St. Patrick who brought widespread Christianity to our shores. Now St. Patrick himself, strictly speaking, was not really Irish. We believe that he was the son of a Roman soldier born in England. When he was a youth of 16, he was taken captive by Irish pirates, raided the west coast of England and brought here to Ireland as a slave. And he worked here for several years, tending the sheep of an Irish chieftain. Eventually he managed to escape. After that he went to France where he studied for the priesthood and later became a bishop. But he always kept in mind that someday he'd return here to Ireland and convert the Irish to Christianity. We believe he came back to this country in 432. But it was another 18 years before he made his way here to the Rock of Cash in 450. And he, when he came here, he baptized the king, Angus, and his children on the site in that year. There's a very old story about the baptism of King Angus. If you have guidebooks, you might know it already. It said that during the baptismal ceremony, St. Patrick had with, with him his bishop's staff for closure, which he was holding in his left hand. And he was saying to the king, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And at that point, he went to stick his staff in the ground. But apparently, he accidentally stuck it in the king's foot by mistake. <laughs> now, the king, we're told, said nothing. And St. Patrick didn't even realize what he'd done until some time later. When he did, he said to the king, well, why didn't you say anything? The king replied that he thought it was all part of the baptism of ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't get off to quite a bad start here. Strangely enough, it didn't deter the rest of the population. They followed the example of their king and they too converted to Christianity. Now in the 10th century, one of Ireland's best known kings came to Cashel. He was a king called Brian Brew. Have you heard that name? Yeah. But he is our best known king here in Ireland. And we remember Brian Brew for the many battles he fought against the Vikings who were in Ireland during his lifetime. He was a member of a tribe of people there called the Dal Kosh tribe. Now until the 10th century, the most powerful tribe here in Cashel was the Ornum tribe. And up until that time, every single king of Cashel had come from that very powerful tribe. But things were changing in Ireland by then. The Vikings were here. They were making regular attacks on Cashel from their base in Limerick. And the last Ornum king here was doing nothing to protect the local people from those Viking attacks. So a young man, Brian Maru, and his elder brother Mahan, they saw that, they saw the weakness and the unpopularity of the king here. They thought it might find their opportunity to come here and to take the crown of Munster away from him. So they came here, they challenged him in battle because the local people didn't support him. They defeated him relatively easily. Now it was the elder of the two brothers, Mahan, who became king here first of all, but Mahan died two years later during a battle. And it wasn't until Mahan died that Brian Maru took over as king. But it was Brian who really went on to make his mark on our history here in Ireland. He was the first king here at Cashel to be crowned High King of All Ireland. Because in those days, Ireland was divided into regions. Each region had its own king, and there was a High King over all those kings. Brian Baru was the first one to be crowned High King of Ireland in the year 1002. He went on to fight many battles against the Vikings after that, culminating in the Battle of Clontarf in 1014. Now, at Clontarf, the Irish finally defeated the Vikings. That was the end of the Viking stronghold in Ireland. 
unfortunately for Brian Brew, who was also the end of his life, he died just after the battle when a fleeing Viking stabbed him whilst he was in his tent. One of his sons and his 15 year old grandson also died at the Battle of Clan Park. But his family remained on in power here at the Rock of Cashel, and in 1101, it was his great grandson, a king called Martha O'Brien, who decided to give this site as a gift to the church. For whatever reason, everything changed in 1101. This became a church site and the church embarked on a building program constructing new stone buildings. Five of them still survive today. We have two 12th century buildings, the Round Tower and Cormac's Chapel. We have 13th century Gothic Cathedral, a 15th century square tower house and the 15th century restored Hall of the Emperor's Court. Okay everybody, so here we are now by the side of St. Patrick's Cross. Now this is not the real cross. The real cross is in the museum by the reception area. It was taken in there some years ago because it was becoming very badly damaged by the weather. Originally it had two arms, thanks to a storm we have only one of those left now. It's a commemorative cross, it was put in place here in 1101 by the King Worth O'Brien to mark the date when he gave this site as a gift to the church. On this side we have a carving of a bishop believed to be St. Patrick. On the other side there's a fully clothed figure of Jesus on the cross. Each of the arms represents the thieves who were crucified at each, either side of Jesus on the cross. On the side you can see a 13th century Gothic cathedral built of limestone. Now the whole of the rock of Cashel sits on an outcrop of limestone. Dig down here you will fit solid rock. So most of these buildings were constructed from the local stone. Now, to the left of this doorway here, you can see a 15th century square tower house. There are many 15th century square tower houses still to be seen around Ireland, thousands of them. Um, these were defensive buildings really, built by the wealthier families to protect themselves and their possessions. They had very thick walls, very narrow windows to make it more difficult for attackers to gain entry. Most of them had four wooden floors. You can see this one also had a stone floor. Now there were many battles fought on this site, so for safety and security, the bishop lived on the upper floors, on the lower floors there were servants and other family members living here. Here on the ground beside this building you see a large piece of stone that simply fell out of the side of the building during a storm 200 years ago. It's been there on the ground ever since. Originally it had four wooden floors inside, they've long since perished, it's just an empty cylinder now. The door to the tower is at the other side, very high up from the ground, about 12 feet. So they used a ladder to get into the tower and they used rope ladders to go from floor to floor. Now at the top of the tower there you can see a conical roof and underneath that roof there are four windows looking out at each of the four directions, north, south, east and west. Towers were probably used mainly for ceremonial purposes to mark the site out as a religious site as opposed to a royal site and uh, they would ring bells from the top of the tower here from the windows to draw people to services or other events taking place here at the Rocket Castle. So that's the Round Tower 1101. Now it's 71 by a gentleman called Vincent Scully as a monument to his family. Uh, the cross was once the largest Celtic cross on the site before being damaged in a storm like many things here at the Rocket Castle. Um, it's not that old but the, the graves itself underneath are a lot older, they date from the 15th century. This is a really cool Disturb the dead bodies, thank you. <laughs> Milo McGrath. Milo McGrath 
McGraw was a somewhat controversial uh, bishop in this area. He started out as a Catholic, but later converted and became a Protestant. However, by the time he died in 1622, he was aged 100 and had been bishop here for 50 years by that time. Quite Up here to my left there, you can see a rectangular shaped window, and that's what we call locally the leper squint. So called because when this church was built, leprosy was still a very prevalent illness here, not just in Ireland, but all over Europe. People suffered from that disease. Generally speaking, people didn't want to mix with lepers. They were worried about catching the disease from them. So they were looked after, usually by the monks, in leper hospitals outside the main urban areas. There were two such leper hospitals in the town of Cashel. However, from time to time, those people came here to the rock of Cashel to go to Mass and receive the sacraments. But when they came here, they didn't sit in the main part of the church with everybody else. They remained on their own to this side of the building, and they watched the service through the window, which became known as the leper's squint. So that's why you have this building here. Um, now in terms of events that took place here, I suppose the worst moment in the history of this church came about in 1647. In September of that year, parliamentarian forces under the leadership of a man called Lord Inchman attacked the town of Cashel and a battle ensued. After two days of fighting, uh, the townspeople fled to the rocks seeking refuge. Fighting continued here for about another two days. The people of Cashel locked themselves into the cathedral here to try and escape the onslaught. Now the attacking forces were unable to break down the doors, which were very strong and had been barricaded, so instead they broke the glass windows, came into the windows, filled their pretty was still alive in the church at that time to set it on fire. So it was very badly damaged during that attack, which became known as the sacking or the massacre of Cashel. <laughs> Okay everybody, so here we are now inside Cormac's chapel. It was built in 1127 by a bishop called Cormac McCarthy. He was both a bishop and a king here. He built this church mainly for his own private use, however it was used as the coronation church for the kings of Munster for some time as well. Built in the Romanesque style, you can see straight away all the arches are rounded and have these chevrons or zigzag patterns. That's a typical feature of the Romanesque style of architecture. You can see this lovely barrel vaulted ceiling, that's also typically Romanesque as well. Now in terms of the layout of the church, we're standing now in the nave area. In front of us there's a small choir area. Now Corporal McCarthy didn't survive very long after the construction of this building. He died about two years later. We have to remember it took quite some time. Seven years to build Cormac's chapel, 30 years to build each of the two faces of the cathedral next door. So many people who started work on the construction of these buildings didn't survive to see how they turned out. But they have left us a great legacy in the form of the 12th century frescoes on the far area of the church. Sir. And these were painted here in preparation for the visit of King Henry II of England to the Rock of Cashel in 1172. So they are very old, but they are very badly damaged also. That's because during the 16th century reformation of the church, they were covered over at that stage with layers of paint and plaster. Um, and they weren't found until the 1980s, but when masons checked the condition of the stone in the room, and then they had to peel off those layers of paint and plaster to review them. And of course, they've been covered up because the church reformers in those days, they thought it was sinful to have highly decorated churches. They thought that simplicity was a more church, where they thought that carving scary heads in and around a building would frighten away evil spirits. Exactly how 